Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you all here with us today, and welcome to Reorienting Boards for the Long Term. I'm Adam Robbins, and I had future investing initiatives here at the Forum. Today, we'll go on two journeys. We'll go on an intellectual journey with our uh, speakers towards understanding stakeholder capitalism. But first, I want to take you all on an imaginary journey um, out of your homes and out of your offices and to Davos. Um, we're going to Davos not just for the spirit of the conversation, but because it's here in 1973 where the forum's stakeholder capitalism vision started. 48 years on, that vision is still going strong. But on the implementation side, we've fallen short as a society. So we're here to address that, that shortcoming as a panel today. We're here to look at the role of corporate boards in particular and how they can align financial incentives, governance practices, and long-term value creation um, towards business models that support more stakeholder-oriented outcomes. We'll be in the hands of Sarah Williamson, CEO of Focusing Capital on the Long Term, who will lead us through our discussion today with an esteemed panel. We'll start with a 30-minute public panel followed by a 30 minute. Sounds like we lost Adam halfway through there. So I'll finish what he was gonna say. This is Sarah Williamson. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, Adam. And thank you for the World Economic Forum for putting this virtual Davos on. So the format is we're gonna have a 30 minute session with our panelists. And then for those of you who are on the top link dial in, we'll ask you to just sit tight for a minute and then we'll transition the technology. So let me start by um, welcoming our panel members to this discussion of reorienting boards for the long term. So we've got four members who are going to share some insights with us today. Uh, Kurt Borklin is the co-managing partner of Premier Advisors, a global private equity firm based in London. Mark Machen is the president and CEO of CPP Investments. Alan Jope is the president and chief executive officer of Unilever. And Amy Weaver is the president and chief legal officer of Salesforce and with congratulations will be the CFO uh, starting on February 1st. So um, welcome all of you. Thank you for joining us today. So at FCLT, we are very interested in the drivers of long-term value creation for all stakeholders. And we've identified these key drivers. And it won't surprise you that the first one on the list is governance. It is essentially impossible to have a long-term organization with the short-term board. That just doesn't work. So today, we're really going to talk about the role of boards in creating long-term value through this lens of stakeholder capitalism. So Mark, let me start with you. Um, I hear different definitions of stakeholder capitalism around the world. How do you define stakeholder capitalism and why is it such an important issue for boards in addition to business leaders and the business community at large? So well, thank you, Sarah. I think one thing to recognize as I think Adam was saying before he was disconnected is that this debate has been going on for a very long time. It's been going on since Davos first started it, the, the WEF first started it in 1973. It's been going on for many decades before that, which is what, what is the purpose of a company and how should it balance? I think it ultimately comes down to balance. How should it balance the needs of its stakeholders? Because I think most people would not uh, disagree that the purpose of a company is to provide a service, to satisfy customers, to provide solutions. Um, and one of the outputs of that is, is profit for shareholders, but it's not the only thing that companies do. So companies have multiple different stakeholders. They have customers, incredibly importantly, customers or consumers, they have, uh, they have communities they operate in, environments they operate in, they obviously have employees, uh, they have suppliers uh, and, and they have creditors in some cases and shareholders in, in almost all cases. So that's what the, the needs to be considered. And obviously in the short term, uh, you might get away as a company with gouging your customers. You might get away with you know, screwing your suppliers. You might get away with destroying the communities and the environment you work in, in the short term. In the long term, that's quite hard to do. And actually, as Sarah, you indicated, um, one of the reasons we founded Focusing Capital on the long term, uh, and one of the founding members was that uh, 
uh, we think in the long term, these things are very, very aligned. And that in the long term, if you do take care of your customers, if you do take care of the communities and the environment you're operating in, uh, if you do take care of your employees, then, then it is much more aligned with long-term value creation. But I think the, the issue is balance, because if you have one thing you're trying to aim for, then you know, it's probably a lot, it's, it's very simple for executives to drive towards that. If you're balancing multiple things, if you're balancing the interests of employees versus uh, the interests of communities versus the interests of your shareholders, so that's where a board re board's role is incredibly important to make sure that you have that balance right, that you have that orientation right. Uh, and so uh, that, that's, that's ultimately, I think, why the role of the board is so important in this debate. Right, thank you. And um, Amy, let me turn to you. So you're a leader of a business that has been purpose-oriented, I think, from its start. It's well known to uh, Salesforce to be a very purpose-oriented company. But can you talk about some of the insights that Salesforce has uh, can offer about how its board, in particular, in addition to the management, functions to engage with the, with the relevant stakeholders? And how, how does a board drive this uh, mindset? Right. Well, thank you, Sarah. You know, as you mentioned, uh, stakeholder capitalism and having purpose-driven company has really been part of our business nearly since our inception uh, over 20 years ago. When Salesforce was created, uh, Mark Benioff, our CEO and our founder, together with his co-founders, also launched what we call the 111 model. And they committed that 1% of their equity, 1% of employee time, and 1% of the product would be dedicated to our communities. Now, in absolute terms, when they started out, uh, these were small or frankly non-existent commitments. But today, having this very intentional model and leading with our values has led to over $400 million in grants, including donations this past year of PPE to support our frontline workers. 5 million hours of employee time and having more than 50,000 nonprofits using our technology for free or at a discount. And as Sarah said so eloquently, eloquently you can't have a long-term focus with a short-term board focus. And that's where our board has come in and played such a critical role. You know, first it starts with just having a bounty of diverse backgrounds and experiences on our board. And I think that's critical in really helping us see kind of, you know, potential blind spots in how our actions might impact the world around us. And this variety also helps provide oversight to ensure that our commitment is really to all of our stakeholders. You know, of course our shareholders, but our employees, our customers, our partners, our community, even the planet as a stakeholder. And it brings experienced governance to ensure that our values are creating values for our shareholders as well. You know, I want to be clear, and Mark just said this, but you know, I believe our board's focus on stakeholder capitalism and ESG has been a positive force in our long-term success financially and in the overall strength of the company. Now, in terms of tactical things that we've done recently to kind of enhance board oversight in this area, there, there's a few things. Um, our nominating and governance committee. Traditionally in the U.S., that's a committee that is used to identify new board members and to kind of oversight of some compliance matters. That group now also oversees our environmental programs and receives regular updates on employee diversity. Our audit committee now has oversight of ESG disclosures that now show up in our public financial filings. And about two years ago, we established a new committee and it governs privacy rights and the ethical use of technology. And it's to make sure that these really critical issues are receiving ample visibility at the board level. I think all of these things have been really essential to enabling our board to exercise its oversight. But several of these last tactics are also really good first steps if you are start just getting started and trying to figure out how to orient your board to have more of an ESG focus. Now that's really helpful. And, and as a nonprofit who uses your software for free, well, I'll add a thank you for that as well. Oh, I'm glad to hear that, Sarah. That's true. Uh, 
but I think those are very practical tips. That's very helpful. So, um, Alan, maybe we can go to you next and, and ask you a little bit that we hear sometimes that the challenges to this idea of stakeholder capitalism or the pressures to be short term instead of long term often come from the investment community, from from your shareholders. So what are you hearing from the investors that is different? Is that changing or what makes you think that that uh, mindset around stakeholder capitalism is evolving? Thanks, Sarah. I mean, I should at this point distinguish that the buy and sell side discussions that we have are different, and I'll focus my comments on uh, the buy side, the asset managers. Basically, what they want to talk about is what's your strategy, what's your thinking on the portfolio, what's your thinking on capital allocation. So if a long-term view and ESG metrics are in your strategy, if the board have determined that, then it enters into the discussion with uh, shareholders. And I can tell you um, the nature of the investor meetings, I've seen a big change over the last two years. ESG used to be a five minute tap and a mention with a junior team member at the end of the meeting. And uh, now it is part of the core discussion. Uh, more and more investors, uh, I've never once been challenged on a multiple stakeholder model, but somehow it comes at the expense of shareholders. Um, we firmly believe that if we prioritize looking after our people, our customers, our business partners, the planet and society, then shareholders will be very well rewarded, much as Mark was saying. Uh, and interestingly, I've literally never once had an investor, and I think I had um, over 100 investor meetings last year, uh, challenge that, uh, that logic. Now, um, we did a lot of work in 2020 on climate and nature. We've had an incredibly positive response so far uh, to our commitment to put our climate transition plan to, to a shareholder vote at our AGM in a few months' time. Uh, I hope that positive response turns into uh, positive votes, and the board have driven us that way. Uh, we went out with some social commitments uh, just uh, last week, actually. Um, but the proof is not what we hear. The proof is what investors do. Um, and we hope that investors will use their hard influence of voting rights um, voting for companies that have made net zero uh, commitments, uh, voting for companies that are making commitments to pay net pay living wages as a minimum. And I think uh, you know better than most of us, Sarah, that we are starting to see capital flows and returns favoring uh, ESG choices. So the short answer is the board determines the strategy and the strategy determines what you discuss uh, with the investors. Final point. A quarter of my pay is linked to uh, ESG and long-term metrics, and that is uh, something the board will take a view on very shortly. Great. Thank you. That's really helpful. So one of the important issues that we've seen in the public markets is this correlation between diverse boards and um, greater long-term value creation. There's obviously been a lot of discussion there, but as we turn, Kurt, to you, to the private side, how do you think about um, diversity in uh, your boards, um, obviously, as a private equity firm, you have portfolio companies where you tend to control those boards. H how are you translating that idea about thinking long term and thinking about diversity in particular, both to the portfolio companies and to your organization itself? So, um, first of all, after 11 months of working from home, this is the first day when my broadband capitulates. So I'm sorry about the half good framing on my iPad for, um, for the session. But look, pr the private equity governance model um, should have a significant advantage over the public um, governance model in the sense that we have a very um, aligned um, circle between the shareholding, the shareholding control, the board and the management team. And therefore, um, we should be able to take both effective and long-term decisions that are in the best interest of not only the financial investors in the company, but also the stakeholders around it. And, uh, and this time perspective that we have of five to 10 years of ownership, instead of any obligation to report, whether that's a planning horizon or not, but report quarterly or even annually to, um, to the public markets, again, as an asset class and an, as an ownership model should give us um, um, a good ability to drive significant um, stakeholder capitalist, uh, capitalism outcomes. If I look at the two highest priorities for me um, in the current environment, they would be one, inequality, and what is happening in the world where we have 
in a town like London, we have 21% of people work in the hospitality and the restaurant sector. Um, a lot of businesses will have been permanently impaired or disappear as a consequence of what's happening with COVID. Um, and then, of course, we've seen massive emergencies, the emergence of income inequalities around the world. And the second is, of course, climate change, which was very much a focal point in the late 90s. And as we came into the early 2000s, Al Gore drove awareness and then the financial crisis came and that dropped down on the agendas of the boards and, um, and governments. And I think the same, what I fear is that the same thing happened with COVID, where a year ago, as we came out of Davos, it was high up on everyone's agenda and COVID then set all the compasses spinning and the priorities have shifted in the short term. We need to get back to solving the long term issues. Now, how we deal with that, um, when it comes to inequality, I don't think that the answer there is um, stifling entrepreneurship or supporting industries which long term structurally are stale. I think the answer is to ensure that everyone in our ecosystem, be it employees, suppliers um, and other stakeholders have, um, have a sustainable business model with economics that even through this period of time um, can and are sustainable. And governments, of course, need to focus on ensuring that education, healthcare, provides equal opportunity for everyone. Um, and as private equity owners, we need to take a long-term perspective where we don't focus on the short-term negotiations with labor, but instead accept that minimum um, wages in different geographies are going up and should go up to provide that. And when it comes to climate, um, what drives me mad is when I see companies acting against climate progressive climate policies. We know that climate will not change unless the externalities of the damages, uh, the damage that companies do to the environment get internalized through taxation and regulation and consumer action and companies should endorse that. Now, to get specifically to your question, the way we get there is to ensure that on the board, we measure those outcomes and that there are individuals tasked aware of um, and experienced with dealing with those two issues. What I see quite a lot is the sort of ESG checklist um, version of greenwashing, which I don't think is healthy because it's not focused enough, it's not pragmatic enough, um, and it's not long-term enough. Just one more follow-up question for you on that, Kurt. I think Amy gave some um, very practical tips about putting certain things on certain committees to make sure that they were covered. As you think about the way that portfolio company boards in particular operate, how do you think about getting these kinds of issues of diversity or climate or the supply chain and so on on that board agenda? Um, because they do operate quite differently than public company boards. Can you give us some insight in how you actually get that topic into the boardroom and get the right people and the right topic into the boardroom to have that discussion? I think one advantage that we have in a private equity environment is that is that we avoid quite a lot of the noise involved with being a public company, right? So if the agenda for a public company board, and I've been on a couple of those, is 15 topics, we have maybe four or five. So it's much easier for a private equity and board to lift, for example, um, supply chain sustainability and climate change into that top five list of topics to focus on and devote very significant time to that with accountability to drive real change. Um, I think public company boards often have a number of fiduciary duties and processes that they need to serve, which eat up, in my experience, up to half could be more of their time. Um, so to me, again, it's about having a very short prioritized and clear agenda with people on that board that have the diversity of thought, the experience to, to act and drive them forward. Right. It, it's not more complicated than that. Okay. Um, Mark, I'll ask you one more question and then I'm watching my time. We'll go to the, the this lightning round. But as you think of you're in, you're an investor in people like um, AB and Allen's companies, you're an investor in private equity and public equity. You know, as, as a big investor, what, what would you like those boards to be talking about um, in that room uh, that, you know, may, maybe maybe is, is or isn't on the agenda today? 
Yeah, we're also invested in Kurt's fund and we're invested in big companies alongside Kurt and private markets as well as in uh, the two public companies as well. I mean, I, I think, you know, listening to these types of sessions, listening to the one today, um, yeah, we, we, I think we, we all buy into this and we, we all get that the, uh, the, the long, in the long term, all of these things can be balanced and are aligned. Um, I, do, I do think it's worth reminding ourselves as to what, why this is a debate right now. I mean, why, why, where, did we, where did we get to? What happened to this started? And I think, you know, it's oft, often quoted that Milton Friedman had a lot, you know, a lot, to, uh, uh, a lot to, to do with this back in, you know, 1970 or so in pushing for the primacy of shareholders. And, and that's the, the reason why, as I understand it, is things were, were so out of whack at that point where companies um, had, you know, a huge amount of, uh, self-interest executives in companies a huge amount of self-interest in just basically paying themselves and also uh, you know, just looking after sort of union rights and, and employees in the U.S. And, and so employees and the executives of companies were doing really well, but everybody else who was a stakeholder was not doing well, including customers. And people quote the auto auto industries in the U.S. auto industry, and you know I'm British originally, and I think of the 1970s as where you know, almost everything was getting nationalized and owned by the government because of a lot of different failures, including the auto industry in the UK, again, uh, was, was owned, uh, owned by the government. And customers were really last on the list of people to be considered. So I think clearly that was really out of balance, but we've come so far in the other direction. So shareholders are the only thing that has mattered. Um, which has made companies competitive, create a lot of value for asset owners like, my, like uh, ourselves. And therefore, it has resulted in uh, increased savings for people who have savings or have pension, pension funds. Um, but you know, clearly, uh, the, the sense is it's gone too far. And then you're back into how far do you put it back into balance? How much more do you lean into uh, the board paying attention to uh, sustainability uh, and all these ESG, uh, all these ESG metrics, and clearly there's an enormous amount of pressure to uh, rightfully being put in place to do that. And I say in the long term, generally it leads to better long term shareholder value, but it, but it is complicated, and you have to spend a lot of time as boards trying to balance some of those things for for most companies. That's great. Well, as a, um, a longtime student of economics, if you go back and actually read the Milton Friedman work, one of the interesting things is he actually talks about company towns and how important it is for companies to look after their company towns. And so, Alan, I don't know what you think of as Unilever's company town now. It's probably about 180 countries or something. Um, but but there is even, even there some recognition of this. So part of this is it's just been taken too far, as you've said. Well, let's, let's, let me ask you one quick um, sort of lightning round question then. Um, so we're, we're going to be making lists of important things we can carry out of this. So what could I ask each of you in five words or less, what's one thing that boards should focus on to, to strengthen stakeholder capitalism as we look forward in this year of 2021? Amy, maybe can I start with you? One thing boards should really focus on to strengthen stakeholder capitalism this year. Sure. One thing that we really haven't talked about is the incredible impact, a negative impact of the pandemic on women. So if I were going to have one wish for boards to be focusing on, I would say get women back to work. Great. All right. Alan? I'm sorry, Alan, you're muted. Four words, equality and climate change. All right. Equality and climate change. Those are good ones. Uh, Kurt? Boards should set long-term, accountable, measurable objectives around inequality and climate change. And Mark? I think everybody's taken the ones I had before. So let me add metrics. I think not numbers, real numbers matter. Numbers are more important than adjectives. Mm -hmm. more, more numbers or the numbers and adjectives. All right, that's a, that's a good one I'm gonna remember. Okay, well, I'm watching our clock and I'm, I'm told we're coming to the end here. So I, Thank you so much, all of you, for your insights. You know, there's there's an old saying that um, the job of boards is um, oversight, insight, and foresight. And I think that what we've heard a lot about today is that emphasis on foresight, looking forward, trying to figure out what's coming next. And it's obviously 
obviously critically important that boards take that long view as their organizations go through um, the ups and downs of these markets. And so I'm, I've taken notes here about um, getting women back to work, equality and climate change, ob objectives, metrics, and maybe all of those, those of us who do serve on boards can think about how we take these um, topics and make sure that they're on our board agendas um, as we deal with the nearer term issues, of course, and the company issues that we're all facing. Um, we'll, we'll put these um, on the agenda as well. So thank you to everybody who has been joining us um, on from around the world on this stream.